Hi, I'm Janice Barnholds Province, and this is a quick tutorial on how to interpret the CVP in arterial line waveforms. When you have a patient like this in your code room, you want to make sure that you're able to accurately interpret the art line and CVP waveform so that you can trust the numbers that are on your monitor screen. So first we're going to tackle the CVP waveform. We have to have our equipment first, so we need the cardiac monitor with the waveforms. We need to have a central line in the patient so that we're able to monitor the right atrial pressure or central venous pressure. We need to have the transducing tubing and pressure bag and then uh, we need to have the ability to compare the EKG to the central venous pressure or CVP waveform. So if a patient were to have a Swan-Gans catheter, which we're not doing here in the ED, you would see the catheter tip, um, the recording portion of it, be actually in the right atrium. We're doing central line monitoring and the central line tip is going to be at the opening of the right atrium, so in the superior vena cava. And what those are measures of is the patient's intravascular volume or right ventricular preload. All right, before we even tackle looking at the numbers on the monitor or interpreting the waveform, we need to make sure that the transducing system has been leveled and zeroed. It's leveled and zeroed to the patient's right atrium. So we're looking for the phlebostatic axis. The phlebostatic axis is the point halfway in between the patient's anterior and posterior chest at the fourth intercostal space. And then you line that up with the stopcock, which is the air fluid interface, and then you are going to zero it. All right, let's talk about the components of the CVP waveform. There's three peaks, the A, the C, and the V wave. And then there's two descents, which are the X and the Y descents. All right, so the one that we're really, um, we really want to pay attention to and be able to recognize is the A wave. The A wave represents atrial contraction, and you need to have the EKG above or below it so that you can see where the A wave falls in relationship to the QRS complex. So the a wave corresponds to the PR interval. So you know that when the atria contract, you know, when the SA node fires, you see the P wave, and then that makes the atria contract, and that's the electrical component. So as that pressure wave travels through the transducing system and then finally to the monitor, there's a little bit of a lag. Therefore, the A wave is just slightly after the P wave. All right, and then there's the C wave which represents closure of the tricuspid valve and it correlates to the QRS complex. And then the V wave, which is atrial filling or bulging of the, of the atria, um, bulging of the valve into the atria, and that correlates to the TP interval. Okay, so why do we care? Because if you look at the waveform, you see that there's a whole bunch of little squiggles. And again, the importance of monitoring the CVP waveform or interpreting it is that we're finding the A wave and we're going to take the mean of the A wave. So you wouldn't want to take a mean of the V wave or the C wave because that wouldn't be the accurate reading that we're looking for. All right, and then the two descents, the X descent represents atrial relaxation, and then the Y descent is the tricuspid valve reopening. Here's another quick little diagram of what is happening to the waveform as the blood is being pumped through the heart. So in the bottom left hand corner you see the A wave, what's happening there, and as the atria are contracting and creating that pressure you get that big um, pressure wave of the A wave and that again is... All right, respiratory variation um, has an impact on our waveform interpretation. We want to measure our waveforms at end expiration. So if your patient is ventilated or if they're spontaneously breathing and you have respiratory variation, so the up and down movement of the waveform on your printout, your numbers are going to be different and where you evaluate your A wave is going to be different. So how I remember this is for ventilated patients, V valley vent. So you're going to end expiration is going to be at the end of the valley on ventilated patients. And that's because on a pressure type of ventilator, the air is being forced into the lungs. 
And then for the spontaneously breathing patient, I like to think of these as mountains. So we're going to measure end expiration at the end of the mountain or before, um, before the mountain starts to slide back down into the valley. Of course, putting your hand on the patient and looking at the waveform is always a great way to verify that that indeed is end expiration. So note, especially when you have respiratory variation, as your patient's breathing, your hands on their chest, you're looking at the waveform, okay, on my vented patient, yes, indeed, the V valley vent is applicable and I'm gonna measure my the mean of my A wave at the end of the valley on this patient. All right, now to the fun part. How do we accurately determine the CVP? So first of all, just like we talked about, you need to make sure that your patient is uh, properly positioned. So you've leveled and zeroed the air fluid interface to the patient's flubostatic axis. Then you're gonna run a dual channel strip of the EKG and the CVP so you can compare the two. You're going to measure the CVP at end expiration and then you're going to draw a line. You need to isolate that A, C, and V wave so you know which one is the A wave. You're going to draw a line from the beginning of the P wave down to the CVP waveform, and then you're going to do it one complex over. So now we've isolated the A, the C, and the V wave. And then we're going to align the PR interval with the CVP waveform, and then identify our A wave. So there it is. And then we need to look at the scale and make sure that it's not too big or not too small. And then we're going to draw a line from the middle of our A wave all the way over to our scale. And that is our CVP number. So in this case, it looks like around 20. Here's some quick little CVP fast facts from um, this great website, Life in the Fast Lane about um, what affects CVP numbers, so volume status, anything preload related is going to affect your numbers, and then what causes a raise in your CVP. The big one um, to pay attention to is uh, our high PEEP settings could definitely affect it, and then anything going on with your heart there, fluid overload. Some more fast facts about accuracy of your CVP placement, just as a reference for you, are all listed there as well. Um, and you can refer back to them later. All right, so what are the highlights of interpreting your CVP waveform? You want to level and zero to the patient's flubostatic axis. The point that you're using is the stopcock, the air fluid interface, and then you're going to measure at end expiration. Pay attention to if your patient is on a vent or they're spontaneously breathing, and then you're going to measure the mean of the A wave. All right, here's some practice. So let's isolate the A, the C, and the V wave. They're labeled for you as well. I've done it for you here. Let's draw a line from one P wave down to the CVP and then over to the next and identify our P, R interval. And then our A wave is right there. If we draw a line across, what do we get? We get a CVP of again about 20. All right, on to A lines. So interpreting the A-lines, that's a whole, it's a lot easier than CVP waveforms. <laughs> so there's three parts of the arterial line waveform. Systole, which is the top part of the, of the wave, and then the dichrotic notch, and then diastole, which is the bottom part. So each of those, what do they represent? Systole, of course, is reflecting the time it takes for the pressure wave to reach that sensor as after the ventricles have contracted. And then the dichrotic notch is when the aortic valve is closing, so you see a little blip. And then diastole is the result. So again, just like with the CVP, you're going to start with leveling and zeroing the air fluid interface to the flubostatic axis. So that happens to be the stopcock, even though you may hear, it's, um, hear people talk in terms of leveling and zeroing the transducer, which is down where the blue label is, the where it says RACVP. So you want to turn that stopcock off to the patient and then open to air. And that allows the system, the transducer, to uh, zero itself after you press it uh, zero on the monitor to atmospheric air. And that's going to be its reference point. So when we have our waveform, we want to do a fast flush square wave test or a dynamic response test. You'll see them or hear them talked about. They're all the same thing. 
and then we want to determine if we have an optimally damped waveform. So what does an optimally damped waveform looks like, look like? It has the systolic, um, the systolic and the diastolic that are easily to identify, and then it has the dichrotic notch that is clear and distinct. And then in order to achieve a fast flush test or a square wave, so you see that how when we squeeze the pink circled area there, that's our flush device, we get a quick little upstroke and then it squares off at the top because it the pressure bag, where the pressure bag is, it squares off at the top and then goes right back down when we release the um, flush device. And what we should see is one to two oscillations after that square, and that's a good looking waveform. Here's another example of what an optimally damped waveform looks like. So you can see the dichrotic notch when you squeeze the, the pressure device on the tubing, you get one to two oscillations after that square wave. It dips down below the isoelectric line and then bounces one or two times. And then we have an overdamped waveform. So overdamped waveforms are something we want to troubleshoot. So you notice on this picture over on the left there's a slightly, uh, the normal arterial line waveform is highlighted in pink there and then when you look at the red you see that there's no more dichrotic notch so that has been lost and then when we do our fast flush it's kind of a slow upstroke and then it slowly goes back so there's no oscillations afterward so over damp and un under damp sometimes that's a difficult concept for a lot of people to get so it was for me so what I like to think of is damp okay so if I walk out in the rain and I get my hair wet what's gonna happen to my damp hair it's gonna go flat so it's like I'm getting rained on the waveform is getting rained on it's causing it to dampen or squish down so again you have none of the oscillations that you saw in an optimally damped waveform Here's another example of an overdamped waveform. Again, you don't see the oscillations and it's kind of slow. It's not a snappy square. It's slow to go up and then kind of slow to come back down. All right, an underdamped waveform is the opposite of getting your hair getting rained on. <laughs> There's too much noise in the system. It's too excitable. So the flash, fast flush generates this ringing or a fling effect. So you have multiple oscillations. More than two is abnormal. So we want to quiet this down. And you could do that by checking your tubing and the circuit, um, making sure there's no air bubbles. Here's another example of an under dampened waveform. So what's needed is for a little rain to happen on that and for us to dampen the system, right? <laughs> All right, let's talk about troubleshooting the waveform. Whenever you see a problem, first you have to identify that there's a problem. Check your patient first. So if it's an overdamped waveform, remember it's been rained on, it could be that your patient is hypotensive. Maybe their blood pressure is really low, and that would also look like an overdampened waveform. So check your patient. Make sure that the position is correct. Make sure that your air fluid interface or the stopcock is leveled and zeroed to the patient's flebostatic axis. Make sure that the insertion site looks good. Make sure that the wrist isn't kinked if it's in the radial artery or the if it's in the femoral area. Make sure that the groin isn't bent. Maybe the catheter's up against the arterial wall. Check for air bubbles. The biggest culprit is the transducer uh, section itself on the tubing. So check for air bubbles there and anywhere else in the system. Look at your tubing and your connections. Make sure the tubing um, is connected tightly to the connections and that you don't have any any leaks going on. Make sure that your pressure bag has at least 300 millimeters of mercury of pressure in it. Make sure it's inflated. Make sure that you have fluid in there and it hasn't run out. Maybe there's a clot at the end of the catheter. So before you um, flush the device, if you're thinking that you have a clot, you want to aspirate first to make sure that you have good blood flow before you flush. Okay, so troubleshooting with the underdampened waveform. First of all, you want to recognize that, hey, this looks really hyperdynamic. So identify that waveform. Your troubleshooting is going to be all the same as it was with the overdampened waveform, except for you want to check the tubing length as well. So 
if it's if it's too long, um, it could also lead to more uh, bouncing around or fling or ringing in that system. So troubleshoot all of those. We've talked a couple times now about the importance of leveling and zeroing your air fluid interface or your stopcock to the patient's phlebostatic axis. So you can see here in this picture that the patient's phlebostatic axis is lined up with the transducer and the stopcock. And over on the right hand side you can see that when it's zeroed the system is a true zero. So the atmospheric air is a true zero. All right, now let's say your transducer is below the patient, so it falls on the floor, or let's say you raise the patient's head of the bed up and you forget to re-level your transducing system. So you'll see here in this picture, if the patient is higher than the, than the transducing system, it increases or falsely elevates your number. So for every inch the transducer is below the mid-chest, it's going to increase your number by two millimeters of mercury. I like to think of this, if you think of the pressure coming out of the heart going down the tubing, it's like a slide. So you're going to gain momentum and as it goes banging into that transducer, it's going to falsely elevate the number. Now what about if the transducer is above the patient? So maybe you decide to lower the bed so you can do some procedures and you don't re-level your transducer. Or heaven forbid your patient falls on the floor, hopefully not. Um, I think you'd have other issues <laughs> anyway. Um, you'll see that as if the patient is lower than the, the air fluid interface or the transducer, then you're gonna get a falsely low number. So I like to think of this as that pressure wave has to climb up that tubing and it's gonna lose all of its momentum as it goes tapping into that transducer. So, th so it's gonna record the number as a lower number. All right, so what part gets leveled to the patient's phlebostatic axis of the uh, pressure tubing? It's going to be the stopcock, not the transducer. So off to the patient, flip that toggle off to the patient and then take the cap off. So off to patient, open to air, then hit zero on the monitor. All right, some fast facts about art lines. The more distal the cannula is from the aorta, the sharper, sharper the upstroke. So if you have a femoral arterial line in, then your waveform is going to look different, a little bit more peaked. And then the um, Inspiration and expiration can also affect your waveforms as well. So you want to measure end expiration just as you did with the CVP here. What's your documentation going to look like? So if you have an arterial and a CVP waveform, you want to document that you've leveled and zeroed them, that you have optimally damped waveforms, um, that your art line is correlating with your manual blood pressure, and you want to print and um, interpret your strips and include those as part of your chart. All right, let's do some quick practice for an art line. What's the blood pressure for this arterial line? So you're going to find that top peak of the systole there, draw a line across to your scale, make sure it's a scale that, uh, that makes sense for your patient's blood pressure, and then draw a line at the bottom of the diastolic area there, and you get a blood pressure. So remember, it's not just the number on your monitor screen, it's your interpretation of the waveform. So make sure that you're doing it accurately. All right, thanks, and good luck with your next waveform interpretation for CVP and art lines.